Shortly after President Obama and Congress signed Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, into law, some of the strongest opposition came at the state level. States like Texas and other Republican states filed legal action against the Affordable Care Act for its mandate for several different reasons. And now some critics of President Trump and Paul Ryan's new American Health Care Act, the replacement or the repair of Obamacare, we may see some of that same opposition at the state level as well. Joining us now to comment on this is Josh Blackman. He's an associate professor of law at the South Texas College of Law. He also wrote the book Unraveled, Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power. Josh joins us now, and it's good to have you with us from Houston. Uh, Josh, I just have to ask, what, uh, what's your first gut reaction to what we're seeing come out of the House of Representatives here with this new American Health Care Act? I think the most uh, striking feature of the law is the fact that there's such widespread opposition, not only on the right, but also on the left. Uh, it seems no one is quite happy with this law, uh, despite the fact that Republicans have had a number of years to put together a proposal. Uh, 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 it seems to make everyone a little bit unhappy. And it's unclear if there are even enough Republican votes uh, to back this law, let alone Democratic votes. And yet it still passes the committee level. It's still going its way through the House with seemingly no opposition. We expect it to get a lot more criticism in the Senate. How, how is it that so many Republicans, conservatives in the House, are going along with something that many critics have called Obamacare 2.0? Well, for example, Rand Paul of Kentucky has called this Obamacare light. Um, this law is different from the Affordable Care Act, but it maintains a number of different features. Uh, how is it the same? It includes subsidies, uh, which are now called tax credits. It's the exact same thing, where the government is giving people money to help them afford health insurance. Uh, this entitlement is very unpopular to many conservatives. Uh, it, it also leaves in place a number of the market regulations that have made insurance so expensive. Uh, this bill, as the president has described it, is only phase one. There's phase two and phase three. Uh, and phases three is where all the action lies, and right. that will require Let's, 60 votes in the Senate. Josh, I want to take a closer look at that subsidy section that you just described there. Essentially, the government is coming to taxpayers and customers and saying, we're going to give you money if you keep uh, paying for this insurance. We're going to help you pay for it because we realize it's so, it's so expensive. But in doing that, that money really does go back to the insurance company, isn't it? So the customer is just kind of involved in the process, but the money still goes from government to insurance company. Exactly. One of the key selling points of the Affordable Care Act in 2010 was that insurance companies would now be given money to offer products. And this was a massive subsidy to the insurance industry. It's true that it goes through customers, but ultimately this money winds up with the insurers. Under this new health care law, uh, it's much the same. Um, instead of giving subsidies, now you're handing over tax credits. And there's no significant difference between a subsidy and a tax credit, because in the same sense, the insurance companies are getting their costs defrayed. So it seems like all this money is, is still funneling to these insurance companies. And already, uh, we've seen from the left, even from the populist movement that backed Donald Trump, a lot of Americans are saying, look, these, these insurance companies keep getting richer and richer. They keep getting bigger and bigger. And our, our plans keep getting more and more expensive. And that's one of the biggest problems that people have. But how can Americans uh, support a bill when all it does is buttress the customer base of these different ins insurance companies and make sure that they will keep plundering the pocketbooks of Americans across the country? Well, I don't know about plundering, but I think it's safe to say that this new health care law doesn't tackle the market regulations which have made insurance so expensive. Um, if insurance was made more affordable, you wouldn't need government subsidies. So an alternative approach would be to reduce the cost of insurance so once again people can afford to buy it. One of the worst attributes of Obamacare was it made insurance unaffordable unless you had these sorts of um, market subsidies. Uh, uh, so if the market was reformed, then you wouldn't need these sorts of tax credits in the first place. So, but there's also this deal where, uh, for instance, AARP has come out and said that this is actually going to impact seniors the most. They're going to see their premiums continue to rise, and those are the people that usually need health insurance more than others do, and all of a sudden the premiums are going to continue to skyrocket as the projection under this new American Health Care Act. And a lot of critics said the Affordable Care Act wasn't truly affordable. 
can we say the American Health Care Act is really American is, if all it does is continue to rob from the poor to give to the rich? Oh, I don't think it quite does that. Well, well it the does. Here, allow... the, 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 what, the, the, the old, the old uh, Affordable Care Act said you're going to pay a tax penalty of $900 a year if you don't buy insurance. You pay that money to the government. This new plan, all it does is keep that in place, but instead of giving it to the government, it gives it to the insurance company directly. How is that not robbing from the poor to give to the rich? One of the biggest critiques of the Affordable Care Act is it allowed uh, uh, insurers to only charge older people more than younger people by a factor of three. That had the effect of raising the rates of younger people. What this law will allow is perhaps some higher rates for older people, but more younger people who need to be joining this law to make it sustainable will have lower rates. Um, the law is designed to have a mixture of both healthy and sick, old and young. The ACA made health insurance so expensive for younger people that they weren't willing to join the marketplace, which made it unsustainable for sicker people. So it's not a matter of taking from rich to poor. The question is, how do you have a marketplace that can actually stabilize itself? If you make it too expensive for people, they simply will opt out, and that's why you have exchanges imploding in state after state. Well, and that's sort of the point, is that the government is standing there saying you must have health care insurance or pay a penalty. And so consumers aren't really free to vote with their feet and leave and stop or drop their coverage at all. And that pressure, when applied properly, forces a company or its chief executive to change policy, lower prices, improve their product. But that, that doesn't exist in this current marketplace. Well, the ECA had a mandate that required you to buy insurance. The way the new law operates is that there's no mandate to buy insurance, but if you decide to go uninsured and later buy a policy, for a period of one year, your premium will be increased by 30%. Um, or you can choose never to buy insurance at all. So indeed, there is a choice. It's perhaps not the best choice, but this new law does provide a choice where you're not mandated to buy coverage. So you're not mandated to buy it, but if you do buy back in, all of a sudden, it is a lot more expensive. So unless you're saving up for that day that you're going to buy health insurance, you know that, that buy-in all of a sudden becomes very expensive. What about people that are buying insurance for the first time? Well, there's somewhat of a jubilee period where it doesn't look back. So now you have an opportunity to buy in uh, uh, without having this penalty assessed to you. But if you're uninsured after a certain point, I think it's 2018, give or take, then this new rule would apply and your, one, your first year premiums would be more than 30% greater. Uh, which is actually far less than if you're being uh, priced out based on the market. So the 30% premium is not nearly enough, I think, to actually discourage people. There was a lot of uh, pushback in, 20, uh, in 2010, two years after President Obama won. He had Democratic control of the House and the Senate. President Trump now has that same luxury. He has Republican control of the House and the Senate. But after pushing something like the Affordable Care Act through, which so many Americans disapproved of, we saw the formation of the Tea Party, a lot of people coming out to the polls in 2012, again in 2014, two big midterm years, and really shifting the power back into the Republican Party. Are you confident at all that this series of legislation, this bill in its current form, will not result in the rise of the left to come and kick Republicans out of power in the House or in the Senate? Well, I have no idea what the politics will be. Um, you look at the electoral map, 2018 does not look like the best year for the Democrats, uh, but it's possible if this, this effort backfires, then uh, they'll be rewarded at the polls. Um, there's always a cost when you uh, do something on a party line vote and you pass the uh, 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 Americans Healthcare Plan Act that any Democratic votes so that we pay back the polls. Uh, but this is, of course, all politics. And if this is a choice they pick, uh, that, will be the, that will be the result and the net effect of this, of this effort. Paul Ryan's leading the way in pushing this on Capitol Hill. He's taking a lot of the credit for the, the design and, and the, the, the machinations, the inner workings of this plan. Do you see anything in there that might be something reaching across the aisle or that's basically borrowing from it? I mean, a lot of people are saying, hey, this really is a miniature Obamacare. So for that reason, do you have any sense of whether or not some Democrats may support it? Um, it's hard to say. I, I think that Democrats will have a general norm not to back it simply because it's Trump care. Um, in the same sense that Republicans didn't back the previous law because it was Obamacare. Uh, uh, but there are a lot of elements here that are quite similar to what's in the ACA. Uh, so perhaps maybe you'll get some Demo Democrats to go along. But I'm not optimistic about that. All right, so uh, some of the biggest things that people liked about Obamacare was, was that uh, pre-existing conditions would still be covered. Can you tell us uh, from what you've seen in this legislation what, it, what, it, what this does to people that have pre-existing conditions? So... Um, it, 
covers them so long as you maintain continuous coverage. If you decide to go uninsured, at that point, an insurance company could charge you a 30% premium when you rejoin the marketplace for one year. Uh, so it would be the case that people who have various conditions could be charged a 30% more for a single year. Um, but after that, but that would apply to everybody, not just those that are sick. Yes, exactly. But it would particularly apply to those who choose to go uninsured. Um, so there were no, there would no longer be any sort of underwriting based on whether someone is sick or not. It would simply be if you chose to go uninsured, you get this higher premium attached to your rate for one year. Hmm. And that expires in in month 13 of your plan. That that 30% add-on. I think so. Yes. Very interesting. And. Uh, there was a lot of conversation about Obamacare and its impact on religious liberty. I know you wrote about that. I'd be remiss not to ask you about uh, what this law does to overwrite or overrule any pre-existing legislation from Obamacare and the way it might impact. We saw a lot of court cases uh, about this very thing. What's different about this in terms of religious liberty, as you've termed it? Um, so actually nothing. The, the phase one, so to speak, of this bill in no way touches the various contraceptive mandates. Um, that would be accomplished through a combination of phase two, which is executive action, and prep phase three, which modifies the minimum essential coverage. Um, the only possible interaction I can think of is that the law says that no subsidies are available for any policy that covers abortions. Um, in some states, such as California, um, uh, the law requires all policies to cover uh, abortions. So there may be problems where these tax credits are not available. Uh, uh, for these sorts of policies. But then if somebody wanted the abortion under their policy, they could still pay for it, and that the insurance policy could still cover them for that. They just wouldn't get the subsidy from the government for it. Not entirely clear, but I think that's right. All right. A lot of interesting information as Americans are pouring over the notes, looking through the, the details here to see how this may impact them at home if these changes take place. Will people be able to keep their doctor? Uh, well, as is, people are losing their doctors because doctors are exiting marketplaces and networks are shrinking. Um, so in theory, nothing in the law will remove that unless insurance companies keep exiting the market and doctors stop accepting certain types of insurance. Ah, uh, but insurance companies seem to be the one lobby on Capitol Hill who like this current piece of legislation. So we will see how that plays out, how much of it changes before it actually gets signed into law, if in fact it does. Josh Blackman joining us from Houston a law professor who's been looking closely at the American Health Care Act, this a proposed plan that would change Obamacare. Josh, great to have you with us. Thank you so much.